Hello everyone, I'm Alex Zimri, I'm a tutor in classics at the University of Edinburgh and since late 2017 have served as the National Outreach Coordinator for the Classical Association of Scotland in collaboration with Classics for All. Before I begin, I'd like to express my warmest thanks to Lisa and the other organisers at Trinity for organising this conference and for inviting me to take part. The work that I have done with the Classical Association of Scotland and Classics for All since the close of 2017 has been to my mind some of the most important work of my career to date. In certain cases, it has proven more fulfilling than even my most exciting research projects. I've been privileged to work with a selection of talented and dedicated people at all levels, encompassing schools, universities and local authorities. Indeed, any successes that I refer to in the course of this presentation are truly shared in nature. And so I'm honoured that it should be me who gets to speak with you today about our ongoing campaign. <clears throat> so, why transfusing classics? In truth, the title and posture of this paper has come to me from two quite different directions. The first is that I'm married to a doctor, and so I couldn't resist framing this paper in medical terminology simultaneously to impress and infuriate her. The second prompt for this title has come from observing the many debates about the nature, nomenclature, and future direction of classics as a discipline. In brief, I'm increasingly of a mind that the many, many of the perennial discussions found on social media today about classics are valuable, but often only scratch the surface of the subject. And even then are all too often focusing on the elite populations of global universities, particularly in an Anglo-American context. I think that part of the answer to assuring a discipline that is accessible and progressive is to make classics something which more learners simply have a chance to engage with at a young age. And also by proclaiming vocally that a lack of access in one's past does not disbar anybody from pursuing it later. By transfusing new, healthy blood into an ailing circulatory system, we naturally, literally inject new life into it, new energies, new outlooks, new perspectives, which naturally expect different things of the subject and will assist in reshaping it accordingly. As a caveat, I'll say that this paper includes at the close some thoughts and observations stemming from my work with CAS. These are self-evidently personal in nature and are informed by my own trajectory into classics as the first generation student from a working class background. I do not presume to talk authoritatively for other marginalised groups within our discipline, be that along lines of race, gender, sexuality, etc. I believe, however, that some of the work we have done in Scotland could easily have a wider application beyond our borders. <clears throat> Scotland has a long history of teaching in classics. Tuition in Latin and Greek, as well as, in, as well as some studies in selected ancient authors, can be found from the Middle Ages onwards amongst the socially privileged. Ancient languages were among the subjects drilled into the young King James VI by the formidable tutor George Buchanan, for example. It's through the Enlightenment, however, that classics in Scotland was really embedded, with the subjects forming a core, similarly, of education amongst the upper classes across the newly united kingdom. The legacy of this tradition can still be observed in Scottish cities like Edinburgh, the self-styled Athens of the North on account of its intellectual community and embracing the neoclassical style in vogue as Britain's rapacious colonial enterprise gathered momentum. A consequence of these deep connections is that classical subjects were a fixture in sec state secondary education for decades. Latin tuition in particular could be found in schools up and down the country. This situation changed dramatically from the 1980s onwards, with a wave of shiny new topics accessible to school pupils such as geography or the rather self-consciously named modern studies, the curriculum in Scotland became increasingly cramped while these new arrivals felt open and fresh, it's fair to say that Latin and Greek had become stale. Regarded as difficult, taught in a manner increasingly out of step with wider pedagogical thinking, and unable or unwilling to present themselves in a utilitarian term to people demographics for whom university was never a realistic prospect. In short, times changed, but the discipline did not. The result was inevitable. It's at this point that we may talk about classics in Scotland flatlining, with departments closing as teachers retired and were not replaced. Far from being a mainstay of Scottish state education, it was as if the subject no longer existed. 
It's no exaggeration to say that we were faced with the near extinction of classics in Scottish state schools as the 20th century came to a close. Indeed, I am largely a product of that system with no chance to study classics at all prior to university and only interested in the subject through watching things like Spartacus or Jason and the Argonauts. I attended a school which had a Latin motto, but none of my younger teachers could tell me what it meant. This was the situation where, facing us in 2016-17 when the Classical Association of Scotland collaborated with Classics for All to conduct a survey of state schools offering classical subjects. The report made for predictably grim reading, with only 18 schools offering any form of exposure to classical studies, and even fewer, only 11, offering any kind of opportunity in Latin. Let me be clear, this comprised a selection of different activities, some offering formally assessed modules, but others only able to offer enrichment or extracurricular opportunities. Scotland is not a big country to be sure. Only 18 schools across a population of between five and six million. To give another indicator of scale, I recently launched a competition for primary schools in the cities of Kirkcaldy and Dundee. As part of that, we contacted no fewer than 95 schools. The prognosis was utterly bleak if nothing could be done to halt the hemorrhaging of classics quickly. This is where we stepped in. Together, we committed to halting the death spiral of classical subjects. Our ambitions were to staunch the flow, to stop the closure of any more departments in the state sector, and then to rebuild the subject across Scotland. Following our initial planning meetings, we set out the following key principles. One, that the absolute dearth of coverage meant that we should work from a position of effective zero, and we should allow the educational community to tell us the best ways of injecting classics at different levels. And two, the watchword for this campaign was and continues to be sustainability. With the combined pressures of our curriculum, which is more cramped than ever, and a finite supply of monetary support available to us, <clears throat> we committed not to engage in flashy projects that, while seemingly grand in the short term, had no built-in longevity. In all our individual projects, then, we seek guarantees of local investment in the initiative, be that in terms of money or time. With our founding principles agreed, we have pursued a broad spectrum approach to outreach. Starting in primary education, an eight-week module was developed around materials in Barbara Bell's minimus textbooks, and the Maximum Classics initiative offered by Charlie Andrew. This was written by Lee Baker, a teacher of classics in Glasgow, and Arlene Holmes Henderson, a classics education researcher with whom many of you will no doubt be familiar. This was designed to be offered at some point between primary five and primary seven, roughly equivalent to key stage two, for those of you more familiar with the system leading to GCSEs. Part of the reason for this was that some state schools offer a brief module on the Romans in primary five, and so it was deemed prudent to tack on to that. We also offered this course to primary schools as a way of slightly gaming the system, appealing to schools who might otherwise struggle to meet the Scottish government's languages one plus two policy, whereby pupils are exposed to two different languages before they reach the end of primary school. While we cannot necessarily claim that a school can use Latin to fit the strict language tuition requirements of the government policy, i.e. spoken language, some schools have found Latin an attractive option in this context, owing to its position as a great leveller, where children and teachers need not worry about a pre-existing disparity or discrepancy in ability, for example. At secondary, I've been focused more on classical studies. Our primary objective has been to steady the ship and to support those few schools that do offer the subject. To that end, we have worked in conjunction with teachers and the Scottish Qualifications Authority, Scotland's solitary exam board, <clears throat> to revamp some of the materials available to teachers on the core syllabus at higher level, and that's the university entrance grade. We've also sought to bridge the gap between secondary and higher education providers and classics, forging connections between schools and universities, and between classes and other subjects, including history, English and drama. In this area, as well as in primary education, we have ev evidently been proactive in seeking out new schools to recruit and bolster numbers. Some of the most important work that we've done to date, however, concerns building something of a classic community in Scotland. 
Given the small numbers and the geographically disparate locations of schools engaging in classics, we have sought to stress that they're not alone, but there are others out there like them, and that a support network does exist. But more on that later. Our final primary strategy has been to press for formal change in teacher training setup in Scotland, where it has been impossible to qualify as a teacher with any classical subject for decades now. Our campaign has therefore been a mixture of the practical and the ideological, with one eye on the daily grind of teaching, another on aspirations to see classics renewed and diversified as a point of social equity as educational. I will proceed soon to what I believe we have accomplished since our foundation, but it would be dishonest to say that it has been entirely plain sailing. Now, I know I'm delivering this talk electronically, but I swear I can almost hear the groan of the assembled audience coming through my headset. Yes, I know, I know, I'm sorry to have to subject you to an image of this buffoon, but sadly he does encapsulate some of the issues that we've faced to date. We knew that starting from effective zero meant that we would encounter considerable lag and resistance. And so I've listed here some of the most persistent issues that we've faced. Now, first and foremost, it's safe to say that COVID has been the bane of our collective existence for the last year plus. Considering that the campaign is now only just over three years old, though, I'm sure you'll realise that this has been a devastating blow to our recruitment of schools and our attempts to encourage centres to diversify their learning options when all they could afford to do was consolidate their regular offerings as much as possible. Even gathering information from our current partner schools has proven incredibly difficult during this period. Beyond this, isolation has been something of a constant in our work. As the only classics were all representative north of the border, there is little that I can do to pool efforts with colleagues across the rest of the UK who work to an entirely different curricular model. This is not to say that discussions are fruitless, but rather practically limited. Isolation has also been faced on an internal level too. While I have coverage of Scotland as a single entity, this theoretically means dealing with over 30 distinct local authorities, each with their own budgets and priorities. Three, the curriculum remains crowded. We are jockeying for position with other more currently established subjects in the humanities and social sciences, and with subjects that have far greater governmental or institutional support in the languages, be this in the form of Scottish Gaelic or increasingly Mandarin. Four, working with local authorities has proven one way to project our reach further and more quickly than I would be able to do going school to school. The drawback, however, is often lengthy delays in bureaucracy, as rampant enthusiasm is buried under a mountain of paperwork. Finally, and perhaps most importantly of all, are still fighting unhelpful, entrenched attitudes about classics in Scotland. Now, by this, I do not mean the ongoing debates about the nature and legacy of classics at all, but rather attitudes concerning the relevance of classics to children across varied communities in Scotland. The implosion of classics in state schools in Scotland effectively resulted in two generations in which there has grown a natural assumption that classics is not for the vast majority, but really only for those whose parents are financially privileged to send them to a, uh, enough to send them to a, a fee paying private school. This attitude has calcified on both sides of the divide. One of my most depressing memories as National Outreach Coordinator was talking to a potential donor, in fact, who, after listening to the nature and objectives of our campaign, replied that he simply didn't believe that classics was indeed for all, and that he felt our work could be achieved more efficiently by funding independent schools to take on particularly gifted pupils. Well, needless to say, it was rather heartbreaking to hear somebody so readily prepared to erase people like myself from taking part in the subject altogether. We parted our meeting civilly, but unable to find much common ground. Now, I find the other side almost more infuriating, though. At a large educational fair offered by the Scottish National Centre for Languages, I was quizzed by numerous parents and teachers on whether Latin was only really a subject for the Boris Johnsons of the world. I spent a while trying to show them that this was an utterly mistaken proposition and one that had, in fact, internalised the educational in in inequity that we currently face. It's only for the bojos of this world in Scotland because we have allowed it to become so. 
So what have we achieved then in trying to battle this? In practical terms, we've not only halted the decline of classical subjects in state schools across Scotland, but we've reversed the downward trend, increasing the number of students that offer any form of classics, be that Latin or classical studies. Since we charted our original numbers on the basis of everything from extracurricular activity to senior level assessed examination, we have followed this process in counting schools here. That said, we are pleased to see that the vast majority of our engagements have resulted in classics being delivered in curricular time, with only one centre committing only to a Latin club after hours. Our deep collaboration with Glasgow City Council, Scotland's single largest authority, has borne fruit. The Council Language Department has embedded Latin into their teaching and training strategies for future years, with the Language Development Officer there now running twilight classes open to all teachers in that local authority. Our ongoing efforts to see initial teacher training in Scotland are continually beset by frustrations, but I believe that I have navigated something of a short term strategy in negotiating a deal with Classics for All to support already qualified teachers and other subjects to accredit in classical studies. Uh, all teachers in Scotland uh, must be signed off by the General Teaching Council before they're allowed to teach any subject at a senior level. Now, this ensures that a small number of teachers are being inserted into the system with no additional financial pressure placed upon the schools themselves. This is obviously a, a fairly slow burn approach, but we have already assisted three teachers in this way with another two gearing up applications for the near future. With many initiatives in Scotland, there is an expectation that attention will be focused solely on the more urbanised central belt of the country. We are pleased to report that our campaign has broken free of this from an early stage, liaising with centres in the Highlands and Morayshire, and finding particular success in the North East, engaging, Scotland, engaging schools rather, in different areas of Aberdeenshire. The network of teachers that I mentioned earlier has been significantly expanded, as much through teacher efforts to spread word of mouth as through our intervention. More than a simple talking shop for teachers in isolation, though, we have worked to see this become something inherently more practical, too, with discussion of SQA examinations and marking, and more recently with the introduction of talks and sessions led by university academics that offer current research-led insights into topics covered by the school curriculum. From a starting point where there was considerable distrust of university academics by some, stemming from a perceived disinterest in what teachers were doing in schools, this has been a particularly gratifying development. Finally, I have made a dedicated effort to reshape the CAS itself, from an organisation focused on university communities in Edinburgh and Glasgow to one in which the accessibility of classics is championed vocally. To that end, we successfully ran an initial summer school in classical languages in 2019, through which I was pleased to meet one of today's organisers. And more recently, I've convened a series of seminars online, del deliberately rather pitched as a gateway to any and all interested. At time of recording, we're about to host our seventh such meeting, and we have seen a domestic audience uh, grow, but also a global one now numbering into the hundreds. Compared to our larger sister and cousin organisations such as the Classical Association in England or the SCS in the United States, these efforts might appear minuscule. In a context where Classics was faced with the very real prospect of extinction outside of selective fee-paying schools though, I believe that these breakthroughs are significant and, more importantly, that they meet the sustainability criterion for progress that we set ourselves in the early days of 2018. Now, before I move on to some of my uh, final thoughts and closing, I do want to offer you insights from one particular case study. In my opinion, one of the most interesting collaborations that I have had in the past couple of years. On this slide is brief testimony from Kimberly Rowan, a teacher in Paisley whom I've had the privilege to discuss classics provision with and to whose classes CAS provided some books and other materials relating to Latin and classical mythology. In the interest of time, I will not go through all of Kimberly's account here and recommend that you pause the video now if you want to read it completely. But I will highlight some of the key points. The emphases in the text are mine. The takeaway points here are that Kimberly teaches pupils who reside outside the mainstream for one reason or another. Her pupils, often living with severe trauma or other difficulties, found that classical mythology was an engaging topic and one in which they located significant contemporary relevance. 
in my discussion with Kimberly, she went even further than this, stating that for some, it was the often difficult and dysfunctional details of the mythological tales and characters that resonated with them. What I hope stands out immediately is that this is an educational environment substantially removed from the stereotypical classics classroom. Utilizing a mixture of language, mythology and reception studies, Kimberly has brought classics to a group who under normal circumstances would have stood even less chance to experience classics than the state school mainstream in Scotland. More than this, however, she has proven categorically that the subject matter has the power to reach even the most difficult pupil demographics if delivered with creativity and sensitivity. Kimberley and her classes in Paisley remain something of a novelty in the Scottish context, especially since CAS cannot claim to have had all that much input in her case. Indeed, she and I enjoyed constructive discussions about the value of classics, but CAS have mainly offered material assistance in her case, deferring to her experience and expertise in working with often troubled young learners. That being said, her case study has resonated powerfully with me, since I think that it's emblematic of what classics can be in Scotland and beyond. It's also worth considering cases like these when thinking about some of the perennial debates that one finds when cycling online. Classics has the power to be transformative when it is taught in the right way to the right cohort. And it's this idea of it being tailored and bespoke that I believe is key. Following some of the debates swirling around online, it strikes me that some of us get wrapped up in the perceived importance of how classics is marketed to a wider audience. Is it to be presented as something utilitarian, something which will help you deconstruct your mother tongue or other languages, or something that will arm you in practical ways for other humanities-based subjects, perhaps? Or are we instead to push the narrative that we should be studying antiquity for its own sake, ars gratia artis, and that presenting this aged discipline in any other way cheapens it? I think that part of this particular argument that I've seen is exacerbated by an assumption among some classicists that our discipline is uniquely placed to service the intellectual needs of the population at large. While I have no doubt that we're a lot of fun collectively, uh, this has never really been my impression of classics or classicists. And so I think that I've always found this friction to be more apparent than real. Simply put, we must be pragmatic. If a school wants to engage with Latin on the basis of assisting English literacy, then so be it. If another wants to engage with classical studies from a perspective of boosting cultural capital, then we should help them get there. We need not also be afraid of confronting the inequities of the present that classics evokes. Our young audience is arguably the most socially aware cohort to date. They live through and experience crises of different descriptions daily, and so we should not shy away from injecting a healthy dose of self-awareness into our outreach work. Indeed, if we are reticent about the darker aspects of classics, all we do is set up a new generation who have to struggle into a recognition of these realities themselves. This is not only intellectually dishonest of us, but it does a disservice to those under our care. Finally, those of us inside the academy, whether it's in the classroom or on the Twitter sphere, are all too often fond of hearing our own voices. As part of the process of engaging young and new classicists, we must be ready to listen to them and encourage them to articulate their own voice, how they interact with the ancient world and how they want to shape the discipline. If we truly hope for our subject to survive and grow, we must be alive to how our pupils and students react to the very material that we place before them. So, where do we go from here? In terms of the CAS campaign, much of our forward work will be business as usual, as far as trying to recruit new schools to the cause and supporting existing centres goes. In addition to this general work though, I intend to focus a bit more attention on the way that the universities in Scotland which offer classics interact with their local and national communities. To be completely clear, I am all for a highly internationalist outlook on the part of unis as a whole. My own student experience would have been inestimably poorer without being able to interact with colleagues and mentors from all over the world. In parallel with this, however, I think that it is noteworthy that while classics largely collapsed in the Scottish school system, the universities have never struggled with recruitment. The reality is that we have three highly rated universities in Scotland whose organisational structure, 
particularly in terms of teaching ancient language, is self-consciously geared towards students who arrive from other systems. It's almost an annual fixture to observe those few who do arrive from Scottish centres struggling to decide which level of language tuition they fit most comfortably with. The prevailing narrative of these students struggle moreover is that the Scots school exams are simply not rigorous enough. Obviously, this is a peculiar case to Scotland, but I'm certain that there are other similar experiences to be found globally of universities pitching to a particular type of student intake that is out of step with their geographical location. Of course, much of this is natural, commendable in some ways, and largely market driven. It seems to me, though, that the process has largely meant that universities have forgotten local missions that form part of their founding principles. Outreach projects become a priority around the crunch point in each ref cycle, only to fade into obscurity once the perceived value has been extracted. This is what I want to challenge. I would like to work with universities to reconsider their ethos in terms of outreach and engagement. We need to end the well-meaning but rather impotent practice of parachuting the stage to the stage for isolated presentations, predominantly to independent schools anyway, which have little impact beyond allowing the university to feel good about itself. Instead, we must harness the power and resources of higher education to develop lasting contacts with local communities where there is little or no access. We must also work hand in glove with schools to develop outreach activities that have a lasting impact upon secondary education beyond the restrictions of a ref case study. Universities must stop wondering what schools can give them in terms of kudos, but rather how they can proactively help nurture the next generation of classicists, and indeed even those who are interested in the subject but have little ambition of entering the field. This is obviously a more difficult task than I'm making out since I'm not deaf to the problems which universities are facing themselves in the midst of an increasingly corporatized educational environment. I believe, however, that there are middle grounds to be found. To give but one brief example in closing, I'm engaged currently on work with the University of St Andrews to, pupil, uh, to develop rather research-led materials that may be distilled into a module for delivery to secondary pupils in the phase referred to as the broad general education in Scotland. This harnesses data for the university, and yet it provides a bank of materials for schools that are replicable and will continue to be relevant long after even the next ref cycle. We do not need to reinvent the wheel, but we must be honest about the quality of the work we do at universities and who is the primary beneficiary of our outreach efforts. If you've made it this far into the video, Thank you very much for your time and attention. As you might have guessed, this is a subject very close to my heart, and so I'm thrilled to be able to share information on it today with you. Thank you very much indeed.